Now that Daisy's still on the show. <laughs> right. I'm still. Our featured I'm presenter is right Daisy the Turtle. So she won't fall. Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready to start here. We're joined by Katrina from Mats, the Mid Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Society, who's about to explain to us what not to do in keeping turtles and tortoises. Do you mind putting the headset on so that people on Zoom can hear you? What? That works. Yep. Can you hear me? So if you're coming through, you have to say, uh, this is test. Thank you, Katrina. All right, thanks. Hi, um, can you can get one of the lights? Yep, I got the lights for you, okay. absolutely. You can't really do one, it's sort of all or nothing. Okay. So, um, good evening. Thank you for coming on weeknight after work. I know how it is. And I, I'm Katrina. I've been the adoptions coordinator for the Mid Atlantic Hill and Tortoise Society for 24 years now. And I've also published. Uh, what I think is a pretty good book, especially for beginners on red eared sliders. I know it's the most common turtle in the world, which is one of the reasons why I wrote it, is because it's also the most commonly miskept turtle in the world. And while I've been doing this, I've learned a bunch. And it humbles me to be talking here tonight because I've learned a great deal from the people in this organization over the years. So I am very grateful for the Natural History Society and grateful for Matt's because I was one of those uh, veterinarian wannabes. And until I joined Matt's, you know, I was kind of upset about that, but I wasn't a vet. But now, here we are. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving at a turtle's pace here. <laughs> so, um, if you looked over, we have a European pond turtle over on the table. Daisy, but I call Daisy the messed up Sorry. It's over here on the front table, challenging down. She had grass and rubber leaves in there. This is her display. Okay. And then I'll also get out my giant Mexican nest turtle at the end of this. Um, and I did bringing a big display enclosure for her for us to do. So, when I'm going to, some of this is going to be a little upsetting because these are direct, um, direct cases that I physically handle that show how you should not keep a turtle. This is what happens when you don't have the right stuff. And I also have to apologize because my original presentation is at home on my PC where we have not had electricity since Monday evening. So fortunately, I have enough stuff cobbled together on a thumb drive <laughs> that I could do something. So here we go. And let's see. How do I advance? Well, I think what I'm going to okay. suggest is that you switch it to. Oh. Oh. Okay, so at start of any presentation, I like to give context information. <coughs> the 24 hour hotline for Natural Resources Police. You see anything hinky? Someone trapping turtles on a state in a state park, someone selling baby red eared sliders on the street downtown. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm I, I never have, but I've seen someone do it. Well, I'm just, I assume you'd seen someone do it. Yeah. Yeah, you can call Natural Resources Police 24 hour right there. You can take a photo of that if you want. Um, they're better than Animal Control or Health Department for responding to that. And Maryland, Maryland has it in their state code of regulations that you cannot sell turtle and oranges. So it's not just a federal regulation in Maryland. Um, and 
the Mennonite Hill and Tortoise Society. That's our website. And we have, we, we turtle, we, yeah, sorry. We have turtles for adoption because it's part of our public service. We take turtles that have been pets that need homes and find them new homes. So we place about 100 a year in new homes. And that's my email and phone number. Again, if you want to take a picture of the internet, feel free. She has it. <laughs> and yeah, one, one of my uh, one of the people I'm always happiest to see at, uh, at any of these events is in the audience. That's Frankie. <laughs> She's helped us with some displays. <laughs> Okay, so what not to do? If you're going to keep a turtle, these are things that you do not want to do. You do not want to research from multiple sources. A breeder may be wanting to sell his turtles or her turtles. That's not always the case. There are a lot of good conscientious breeders out there, and we recommend them. But don't just trust the breeder. Don't trust just the person with a, with a, a table at a reptile expo. You know, even though there are a lot of people that are selling animals at expos, some of them are just trying to make a sale. Some of them are really good. So talk to multiple vendors, talk to multiple sources, look at multiple websites. Don't just look at one Facebook group. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Don't listen to what the pet store tells you. <laughs> <laughs> pet stores are also trying to make money. Sometimes they require that they only tell you about what they sell. And sometimes there's not an expert there, you know, at the counter. So we, some of them are, but some of them aren't. So again, multiple sources. Don't learn about the natural history of the species in detail because each species is different. What works for a box turtle is not going to work for Daisy the Sulcata. And Daisy is an exact as proof of what not to do with a turtle or tortoise. So when I say turtle, in this instance, I'm going to mean turtle and tortoise. Okay, because all turtles are tortoises, but not all tortoises are turtles. Um, again, like I said, what works for box turtle is not going to work for a sulcata. What works for my European pond turtle over there is not going to work for my giant Mexican musk. Don't make your certain enclosure secure. Um, we get about a dozen, maybe more calls each year for either missing or found stray turtles and tortoises. We've already helped reunite two this year, and there have been about four or five other strays that we haven't been able to find them. Um, let's see. You want to make sure your enclosure is screened. It's outside, especially if it's going to be outside at night. You want to make sure it's screened to keep out predators. Turtles and tortoises can climb, so you want to put a cap across the top edge, or at the very least, cap the corners. And when I say some turtles can do parkour, I'm not joking. I've seen a turtle get out of a temporary enclosure, climb up on its hide log, box turtle, use that hide log to get out of a very tall, um, Rubber made bin, and then somehow go two feet into another enclosure. So, yeah, make sure they cannot get out. They climb better than you think. Don't use the proper substrate or bedding. Each species is different. Daisy is kind of proof of that. She was a bad substrate as well as other things. Don't keep the turtle the right humidity. That kind of goes with the bedding. If your bedding doesn't hold humidity, your turtle's not going to have humidity. Again, each species is different. Don't offer the right food. See where I'm going with this? Each species is different. Don't keep it at the proper temperature. Some need it cooler than others, surprisingly. And don't have the right enclosure, because again, each species is different. So what's the takeaway? There you go. Okay, the primary cause of illness is stress with any animal. Stress is our, is our biggest hit on our immune system. 
and whatever turtle, whatever we can get, turtles and tortoises can get also in them. So, so if the temperature's wrong, it's going to cause stress. If there are no hide spots, it's going to cause stress. I thought I had brought a hide spot for uh, my European pond turtle. I forgot it at home. So sorry, buddy. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Because I'll show you what I usually use a lot for the aquatic turtles and the box turtles. Other turtles and overcrowding. It may not be overcrowding. It may just be another turtle. I mean, how many of you had a roommate at one point that you didn't like? But you couldn't cut the lease or you're in college and you couldn't get a new roommate? This stressed you out. Of course, dirty water and the wrong foods. Wrong foods can also, I'm sorry, what is it? I don't know, maybe they just move it away from your mouth a little bit. Like, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, just, oh, there we go. We can bend. Uh huh, there we go. Stubby. Okay. Don't learn about the natural history. Why is the natural history important? What does it eat? Where does it live? How does it make its living? In this case, this turtle came in. She had, these are actually overgrown crushing plates right there. Some species eat really hard natural diets, razor clams, oysters, things like that. Maybe crawfish, crawfish, other crustaceans. And if they don't have that hard diet in captivity, these crushing plates are gonna overgrow and cause a lot of problems. And also, here's another health issue. She has a lot of edema going on there. She looks puffy there. I say it, this one didn't make it. I suspect she's fed a lot of goldfish over the years. Something else you shouldn't do. Goldfish have thiaminase that destroys uh, the B1 vitamin. And without B1, you have neurological problems and you have heart problems. Heart problems can lead to edema, like what you see there. Um, yeah, plus, I think it covers it in another slide. But your dog and bacteriophytes, map turtles, those definitely have crushing plates for the, especially the females. The males eat a lot of insects, the females eat a lot of crustaceans. The muds and musk can have it too, because you've seen the size of that head compared to the body. They're eating a lot of hard stuff with that big head. And then sometimes we get the red-eared sliders. Again, the females, usually are eating a different diet from the males. Okay, and I was gonna say with those crushing plates, if they're that bad, the food is gonna fall out of the mouth while they're eating. Mm -hmm. If it's really bad, it can cause abscesses in the roof of the mouth. And then they have to go to the vet and be anesthetized so that those can be ground down. For food, try to use a variety. Um, this, this is some of the food that we use regularly, and because we get to go through about 100 pounds of food a year, uh, we get the Missouri Aquatic Turtle for about $3 a pound. The Missouri Crocodile pellets are even cheaper than that, and those are, don't get the big ones. The big ones are like a dog biscuit, because those are for adult crocodilians. So we get the small ones for the snappers, the muds, things like that. Okay, what caused this? We think we know what caused it, but what do you think might have caused this? Anybody? Tim? Well, for those, for those that don't know, for those that know what, what you're seeing, this leg is swollen here. This leg is a little bit swollen. This tail was swollen. This is edema right here. Come to find out, this turtle had not had, this is the eastern box turtle, he had not had animal protein for five years. Yeah. Box turtles have to have animal protein in the diet. Some animals shouldn't have it, some have to have it, some have to have it more than others. And it turns out, if you have an imbalance of protein, it leads to edema. So all this edema under the skin is caused by a lack of protein in the plasma in the blood. And 
Fortunately, this fellow ate like a champ. Um, the antibiotics, I could not inject him because the swelling was so, had gone so long um, and was so extreme, he started sloughing the skin. Like he was literally kind of being skinned alive. Is it? <laughs> Someone um, trying to get out over there? Yeah, I got the top. Okay. <laughs> so you can see here, the skin start cracking and peeling off. That is, this is dead dry skin coming off and that's sort of skin underneath it. <laughs> and the skin was coming off the tail too. He made a complete recovery, but like I said, thank goodness he ate like a champion the whole thing because I was able to put the antibiotic that it was, I was able to use it orally instead of as an injectable because I was afraid if I held him to give him an injection, something was going to slip off, like he you know, lost toenails. So, but once he ate earthworms, like they were going out of style. Earthworms are really good food for box turtles. They're natural, they have a little bit of toughness to them. They have good calcium ratio, good protein. So they exercise the beak and they're a really good food source for box turtles, along with other things. Because again, you want a variety, not just one thing. And he did make a full recovery. Once he started eating protein again, he felt a lot better. And I wasn't able to add a picture of a bad beak, but along with diet, natural is best whenever possible. I want to show you these striations right here. This is a very recently imported Russian tortoise. Almost all Russian tortoises in the U.S. are wild caught imports. So he's what you call fresh off the boat. He still has these really this, these nice serrations like a steak knife. Because ironically, even though it looks like a steak knife, he's eating a lot of tough greens in the wild. So he needs those serrations to cut through those greens, through the uh, the bushes, the low hanging bushes, leaves from those, what we consider weeds that are actually wild native plants. And same thing with the silcata. You can see the serrations right there because he's used to eating a lot of wild plants. And even when they go to pull it from the ground, it's going to cause resistance and keep their jaw strength and keep that beak proper. And wild diet whenever you can, as much as you can. And we have a lot of, um, on our Facebook page, and I'm starting on our on our Facebook group, it's private on our public Facebook page. I tr I'm trying to post things that they can eat that they can find anywhere that you can get them from outside. So the spider work post recently. Oh, we good. Have, yeah, you saw the spider work. We have work. that growing in our yard. So. Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people have in their garden. It's a native plant. They, every reptile I know loves the flowers. Okay. Here is what you do not do. Um, this is a, this is Steve Austin. Some of you may remember the TV show, The Million Dollar, Six Million Dollar Man. His name is Steve Austin. When I saw this one, uh, after I evaluated him, I realized we can make him better. So that's that's part of the Six Million Dollar Man. Uh, Fox Jones. <laughs> so this is him when he first came in. Very overgrown beak. Uh, the beak should be, this upper beak should be pointing down, not out. This one should be pointing up, not out and flat. The nails are the longest you've ever gotten in before. You can see the nails there too. This is him a few years later. So, he had been kept on Reptibark, which never, ever, ever used Reptibark. That's the other thing I wasn't able to do today. Um, do not, I, I want to make a list, show you a list of things not to use. But Reptibark is one of those. They, it rolls under their feet. It doesn't hold humidity. So in, you add water to it, it's, it's not going to absorb it. The water's going to evaporate too fast or create a soggy mess on the bottom. It's dusty, 
And again, like I said, your bowl's under their feet. They can't really burrow into it, so it causes foot and joint problems. And if they're, yeah, if they're too dry, it's going to cause skin, eye, and shell issues. If they're younger, it's going to cause shell issues. So you can see he has what we call a skin cap up here. And because he's a rock substrate, the nails overgrew. We started a beak trim, trimmed his nails. A few years later, you can see his nails are perfect. He was adopted by one of our members who continued trimming the beak. You can see, look at the difference in the scales here. See how these are kind of raised and rounded. You can see skin between the scales. That's from being too dry. You see here, besides the fact he's obviously eating really good, you don't see skin really between those scales and the scales are flat. Bottom beak may never recover completely. We've noticed that with some of these that have really bad beaks like this that are more like a bench beak that grows out. But he eats well, he eats by himself, he's doing great. Look at the color, he's been outside in a human environment. Even though people think ornate box turtles are from the desert, they spend a lot of their time in burrows where it's humid and it's temperate. And the humidity and temperature is actually a lot like what an eastern box turtle spends in the forest here in Maryland. So they need more humidity than people think. So you can tell he's been humid, he's been out in the sun, his color has changed. Um, you see how his eyes are kind of puffy in this one, and they're not here. And he's starting to get that green head again that male ornates usually have. Okay, don't do your research. Do an impulse buy. That's one way, that's one way to not take care of your turtle. The best example is the radiator slider because it's cheap and it's tiny when most people buy it. So you're not doing your research. You're believing the person that's buying it who might be saying it's gonna stay tiny. Um, and landlords rarely allow more than a 20 gallon tank. That girl up there, the big one, is she's going to need a 125 gallon tank. She was about 11 and a half inches long. Um, and again, I, I said earlier to somebody that sliders and other big turtles and horses, the more the bigger they are, the more eggs they lay. The more eggs they lay, the more they can be sold. So usually the cheapest animals on the market are going to be the ones that are make the they don't make the best pets for the average person because they simply get too big but they make a lot of money for the sellers and then this little one over here this is how he came to us straight from um artscape someone bought him at artscape and a few days later realized how big they were going to get and decided to bring him to us right away so if you see anybody selling at artscape Please use that 24 hour hotline number and call natural resources, please. Again, uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, perception is different than reality. This is an enclosure that we sell on Amazon. Uh, this is what one of our members made for her rendered slider. It's a 150 gallon stock tank with big filter, homemade island, and she had heat lights hanging, well, heat light and UVB lights hanging from the ceiling up here. So most people think they can have this, but they're actually going to need that. Here's an example. And you saw that little blue thing. Here's a good example for a hatchling enclosure. Again, remember I said hide spots? The basking area, there was a UV light and there was a heat light. And our wonderful member, Sandy Barnett, created this to foster some turtle stores. And our equally wonderful husband took pictures for us. If you don't do your research, you're not going to realize how big it's going to get, and you may not be prepared for when it does get big. This is Voodoo. Can you, can you tell what's wrong with her? Yeah, she was kept in a bucket with shallow water while she was growing. If box turtles don't have enough humidity, 
if growing tortoises, well, I should say growing box turtles and growing tortoises don't have enough humidity, or if aquatic turtles are kept in water that's too shallow, you're going to get sombrero shell, where the marginals turn up. And you can see she is bearing it all, he or she. She is also missing a leg. Um, the males didn't get very long, so we're thinking it's a she. And she gets along with other turtles, which not all sliders do. But she's living a great life. She lives outside in the pond now in the summer. And it comes inside into a 100 gallon tank now. So, yeah, food news is love and life. But this is what happens if you're not prepared for when they grow. Okay, talked about the substrate and humidity. If it's a baby and it's not wet enough, it's, the shell's gonna curl. And if, they're, if the adults are kept too dry, they get what we call a uh, skin cap. This is one that actually fell off of a turtle after it was kept in the humid environment again. So you can see it actually looks indented there. People say, oh my God, it needs to go to a vet. Your turtle, your turtle has a major problem. It may have a major problem, but it probably just needs a, a better substrate and a lot of humidity. Here's what I use for a lot of box turtles and Russian tortoises and even Daisy the Sulcata here is on this mulch. I get this at a place called um, Stoppers of Kissel Hill up near York, Pennsylvania. I used to get it from Binkies. Oops, sorry. When there used to be a Binkies, for those who remember, down near um, Green Bellsville. Just to get a really nice nursery. These are plant nurseries. The best stuff comes from plant nurseries. Although you can try to get it from home improvement stores like Lowe's, but it should be closer to dirt than mulch. Very well aged hardwood mulch or double shredded, triple shredded hardwood bark mulch. And you see, they can dig into it, they can burrow. There's a little head right there. They're very happy sitting there hiding, waiting for a bug or a snake or a fledgling bird to come by. Because box turtles are little or velociraptors, believe it or not. And this, you can forget missed it. You see a lot of care sheets, a lot of websites, missed it, missed it, missed it to keep the humidity up. Uh -uh. Pour the water in. Get a jug just for the turtle water. Fill it up, pour that water in. It should be damp to the touch. Hide spots, really cheap. A dollar a piece or five dollars for a big fern at Walmart in the craft section. Uh, you don't have to go to the store and spend $20 for a high spot, but this will make your turtle feel safe. Again, stress can lead to illness. If you don't want to keep your turtle, don't secure your habitat. Turtles and tortoises can climb way better than you think. Here's an example. Someone took a picture. That's how they found their Russian tortoise in their pen one day. He climbed up and wedged between two pieces of wood. Uh, fortunately, she did have a cap on her enclosure and wasn't able to get out. Screen the size if needed and definitely screen the top, especially if they're going to be in there overnight. Raccoons, uh, let's see, raccoons, fox, skunk, coyotes, chipmunks, birds, all the way down to wrens and sparrows. They will all eat turtles. Wrens will take off with hatchlings. Um, and right here, if a turtle or tortoise can't see out, it's less likely to want to escape. So if you have a visual barrier along the bottom, that's going to make them happier and less likely to escape. And also, less likely to lead to rubs. If you had just screen on the bottom, a turtle may walk back and forth along that and scrape the shell. Oh yeah, and sulcatas. I haven't weighed Daisy. I know she might weigh two pounds, maybe three, 
But once they hit about 40, they can start going through chain link fence. They can start going through drywall. They can move things. They are incredibly strong. So you want them, some people drive rebar into the ground every few inches so that their sulpatas don't escape. So something to keep in mind if you want to keep it curled. Again, you want the top to be screened in. Because even if you think a raccoon can't climb that, you're wrong. This belongs to our president. He says he regularly, at night, he regularly sees raccoons on top trying to get in. Plus, again, if you have hatchlings, birds can get in and get your hatchlings. Okay, lighting. What you don't want to do. I've gone into nature centers and asked about the lighting for their turtle. Come to find out, they thought their UV light or an LED light was a heat light. If you get a heat light, make sure it actually produces heat. Because now they sell a lot of these LED lights and they don't have heat. And if you want a UV and a heat light together, make sure it's a mercury vapor bulb. Otherwise, you're only getting one. Don't use the coil bulbs. Those have been known to cause eye problems and they don't produce very much UVB at all. This is a little bit better. It's not a coil, maybe a tube, it's not a coil. But the best ones are the long bulbs, like what we used to use on fish tanks. Make sure there's no glass or plastic between the bulb and the turtle. A lot of, um, I'm trying to think of which brand. Some of the brands sell a UV strip light kit with the light in it, but also has this piece of plastic under the light. So you have to remove the plastic and then put in the light bulb if you want to change it. The UV doesn't go through plastic. So why sell with the plastic in the first place? I've got in turtles, the owner bought a new UV bulb religiously every six months for a few years. Gives me the turtle. That UV fixture still has the plastic on. It. Turtle is getting no UVB. Okay, let's see. Do not, I like to leave lights on for 14 hours a day. That simulates full summertime. A lot of places say 12 hours, but that's fall. That's the uh, equinox. So is your turtle going to go, is it summer or is it fall? Do I need to stay awake? Do I need to get ready to hibernate? So I, I do 14 hours. Don't leave it on for 24 hours because that's stressful. Your location of your, of your lighting, too. Okay, so one of the problems, I'm not going to go over all that. You can look at it if you want. So if you look at Daisy, she has this pyramid in here. She should be smooth. I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> By the way, these also these also make good um, turtles and some tortoises. Box turtles and some tortoises will chase a laser pointer like a cat. So I'm going to show you here. This should be smooth. They think one of the causes of pyramiding is too dry while they're growing. Also, too concentrated of a heat spot. Top of that keratin is drying out, and then it kind of sucks up on that bone. So you want your heat spot maybe to be a little bit less heat, but a wider area. So they're not sitting under concentrated heat and then leaving it, and then coming back and getting more concentrated heat again and leaving it. Maybe they'll kind of hang out a little bit more, but not with that concentrated heat. And you want a gradient. You want cool in and a warm in, not just a cool in and a hot spot. So that's part of her problem was, oops, I'm sorry. I should see that. The fancy color, for people that don't know. <laughs> oh, wait, she is. I'll just check it out. OK. You can do this with your aquatic turtles, too. They'll chase the laser pointer. But not with all these people watching. <laughs> She'll eat with anybody watching. <laughs> yeah. Don't look at a DIY. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. They can show you how to make things yourself, make your own filters. So my one over here is excellent at making your own filters. You can make your own enclosures. Make your own basking platforms rather than spending a ton of money 
uh, with your, you know, and pestle. Don't take the temperature for granted. Get get a temp gun. This is one I got at Home Depot for about thirty dollars. It also works as a laser pointer. <laughs> Um, or you can get the little ones at the pet stores, the little uh, click and point infrared thermometers. Here, it was nice and sunny in January. The grant, and I figured I'm going to take the tortoises out for, for an hour or so, so they can get some real sunlight, real UVB. The ground was 53 degrees. A lot of people would say that's too cold. But look what happens when they're in the sun for 15 minutes. That is 76.5 on his shelf. So if you're in doubt, get a temperature gun. Check and see what it is. And if you're with the aquatics, if your water's too warm, they don't want to bask. If they don't bask, the shell doesn't dry out. It can lead, lead to the shell rot. If the water's too cold, you can have lower immunity. So let's, again, know your species and what they need. So most... Most turtles can go 70 to 76, warmer for sick turtles. Other, you know, other species may need it warmer. Other species can go colder pretty often. Uh, spotted turtles actually need it colder than, than a lot of other turtles. That's why it's hard to breed them in Florida. It's warm there all the time. And also, don't use a regular aquarium thermometer for turtles. Again, they can see color. They see that red light. You might try to bite it and break the glass. So they make turtle safe aquarium meters. Cohabitation. Everyone says your turtle needs a friend. No, turtles are jerks. They are. They are truly are jerks. This girl uh, was living with two other, with two male red eared sliders, and they did that to her. I had, we took in a male that was even worse and had been living with a large female who got fed up with the male and did the same thing to him, but only worse. Both recovered perfectly. That's her there later yeah. after she recovered. And this one, his cohorts, AKA his brothers and sisters, most likely, bit his tail off. So he had to have surgery to actually expand that area because, um, uh, we call it, um, you know, uh, shoot, my brain, it's fried. But scar tissue, the scar tissue actually made that too narrow and had to have surgery to open it. So unless you really know your species, some species tend to get along with each other better than others. Some sexes tend to get along better with others. Don't ever put anything female with a male painted. It's not going to end well. They're just, they're the worst jerks. Radiator sliders are very individualistic. You never know if they're going to get along or not. If you're going to mix something, uh, you want a very large enclosure with a lot of high spots, a lot of climbing spots, a lot of visual breaks so they can get away from each other. Uh, some species can be compatible if you have a large enough area and you provide everything each one needs. Clearwater Nature Center in Clinton, Maryland. I don't know if they still do. They used to have an in-ground pond that had uh, this island in the middle. So they had mud turtles that could climb up the rocks that were around the island. And then they had big aquatics. Normally that wouldn't work, but they accommodated everybody. Multiple turtles can lead to multiple injuries. You're more likely to get eggs from a female if you have a male. So something to keep in mind. Terrapins and red bellies, cooters generally are gregarious and tend to like to be together. But again, there's always, always individual animals that won't get along. Be prepared to separate. If you keep anything with muds and musts, unless you have a huge enclosure, you're going to end up with nip tails and toes. One thing I've seen people that they that they don't do is they don't figure out what sex their turtle is. If you have a female, you need to know in case she has to lay eggs. Um, I always hear uh, if it has a flat bottom, it's a girl. That only works for terrestrial things, box turtles, semi-aquatics, tortoises, 
because they have gravity working against them, so the male needs that concave bottom shell. Uh, in aquatic turtles, you don't have gravity working against you, so they have flat bottom shells. So just to dispel some of the myths. Uh, North America is the only place where you can find turtles where the males have the longer front toenails than the females. So that's kind of cool. We, you know, we're special for something. So here's what you don't want to do. Someone wanted to adopt a box turtle. Send me the application. Okay, looks okay. Set up an set up an enclosure and send me a picture. This is what they sent me. Who wants to <laughs> point out what's wrong with this? Frankie? Um, like there's Follow. one hide. One hide. The water in this is a little shallow. Like the substrate doesn't look like it holds humidity very well. And I think that's a 20 gallon enclosure. Okay. It's a 40 gallon. But it's a 40 gallon turtle tank, which means it was designed so that you could put an over the tank filter over one end, and those are usually crap anyway. But so, A, your turtle could climb up, could do parkour, climb up here, and climb out and be on the floor. These are cedar chips, big no no. Even, even if it was pine chips, big no no. Can't, it can't hold humidity, they can't dig into it. This is way too flimsy, he's gonna flip that over every time. Um, yeah, it's pretty bare. He's gonna he's gonna feel stress because there's just not enough stuff going on. And if that falls into there, that's a fire. I told them they could not adopt a box turtle from me until they figured it out. They told me they had actually uh, purchased a Central American wood turtle, which is even worse because they're even more aquatic than our box turtles. So I, you know, I hope I hope they took my advice eventually. What did you do best? This is someone again wanted to adopt box turtles from me. I said, send me your enclosure. They already had box turtles. This was the enclosure. There's a water, a water dish with a huge rock in it. They can't soak in it. Uh, I don't know how they can even get into it. There's two box turtles right there, two three-headed box turtles. Uh, the food's way too big. It's not chopped up. Uh, yeah, red light is not a good idea. I've heard that it hurts their eyes. I don't know what that actually does, but they need white light spectrum to do it, you know, to actually enjoy life, to do what they need to do. So again, this one, I said no. And right under the kitty litter pants. At first glance, this one may look good. I did not include pictures of her. She was what we call a monster. Over the years, we've been in turtles that look so bad, they look more like monsters than turtles. That's what someone said on a form. So we started calling them monsters. She had a very long overgrown beak. She had a lot of um, stuck on scales that never shed. Um, so this is big enough. And it's sad they spent a lot of money. Like it had a lot of stuff you would want. Everything's on timers. She has a nice big water dish that she can easily get in and out and soak. She has a hide, a hide, more hides. Um, that's a heat rock. You don't want a heat rock for anything, especially not for turf. This is reptile carpeting. This is reptivar. This is all dry. So she was just being kept way too dry. There's a heat light. I think there was another heat light too. So she's being kept way too hot, way too dry most of the time, even though if they had just put the right substrate in there and taken out the hot rock, it would have been great. These are good examples. These are temporary enclosures. Uh, this is a, someone was fostering a box turtle for us. This is a Rubbermaid tote, heat light, UV light on the screen. The screen is zip tied so it won't fall off. Hide spot, hide spot, hide spot. That's a food dish, not a water dish. The water dish is out of sight. And he even took a pot, partially buried it, and then covered it with a whole bunch of the substrate, so it's more like a cake. This is for hatchlings. 
And very damp, you can see it's not dry, it's damper, there's a lot of little hot spots. And again, the rubber made tote, great for temporary closures. So, I don't know if, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I included more. So, so that's how you don't keep the turtle. Now, I have a video I'd like you to see. I want you to keep in mind each of these animals is a um, each of these animals is a pet. Even the ones that are perfect, those are pets. You can keep them perfect if you have the information. Do a lot of research for multiple sources. See how that. I, I tested it earlier and I'm not sure there is any sound on the beginning of this and then some music starts playing. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, right there, that, that box all the way to the right. Oh. Keep going. Keep going. You want to say full screen? That one? Yeah. Here, thank sorry. You. Thank you. Yes. That might have been a congenital a birth defect. That's what he came in. That's the Sandy Barton had some solutions. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's what being outside, you know, on the right diet. Wow. That was also someone's pet. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Sulpata Station doesn't exist anymore. Mm. See the AQ? 
Those are some of the people who provided photos. Yes, yeah. And I have some recommended books. Maybe I should grab a couple to show. Yeah, the sure. Audience. I'm going to turn the lights on. Oh, he's going to be the phone. I thought I said that. Wrong. I'm from Texas. This is Agave. She is my giant Mexican must turtle. I feel like they're very small. Yeah, normally, you know, most must turtles are like this big. I don't like that big. Yeah. So. <laughs> So again, here's that incomplete shell. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that makes her a must turtle like a snapping turtle. So thankfully she cannot move her head as far. She doesn't have the range of motion with that head and that neck that a snapping, a common snapping turtle would. She has more like a um, alligator snapping turtle range of motion. So. Ooh, how long have I had her now? I can't remember. About 15, 16 years, maybe. Yeah, of course, Daisy. Daisy has a uh, underbite that Dr. Gold at Chadwell Animal Hospital is working on. It used to be a lot worse. She actually had a little prosthetic that he attached to the front and kept her mouth open for a while. Try to work on that. And even though she looks pretty messed up and she hasn't grown in three years and sulcatas should be growing a bunch, one thing really going for her, she puts that hind foot down flat on the ground. A lot of them, if they've been on a bad substrate or no substrate, they'll walk on the side of their foot and they'll have hip issues. But she does put her foot solidly on the ground. So that's one thing she really has going for her that's really good. Good job, Daisy. How long have you had Daisy? I think three years now. Uh, she hasn't grown in three years. She's heavy as a brick, hmm. but she hasn't grown. Hmm. She was actually sold, again, multiple sources. She was sold from a dealer at a uh, Northern Virginia Reptile Expo. She was a hatchlet, and they told the woman she was a Russian tortoise. They told her she was a captive bred baby Russian tortoise. Hmm. She only brought Daisy to us when she realized she had a sulcata and not a Russian and knew she would get huge. Hmm. If she hadn't come to us, I don't know how much worse she would be. Russians don't even get nearly that big. No. Oh, we've had we've had a female or two that were close. How, how old is she, do you think? She might be eight now. So, and I know a lot of people overfeed their sulcatas and they grow too fast in captivity. Um, it's like either they feed them too little or too much. A lot of people feed them too much and they grow too fast. So, you know, she should definitely be at least 30 pounds by now. So, and she might be three. But, I mean, she's really happy. Hmm. So, and she eats like a pig. So, and she's got to be a little bit of a bully herself. And then over there, we also have the European pond turtle. I have a box turtle shell. And Sam, what did you bring? Just, uh, just a couple of cats of them. I'm going to show the audience, too. Okay. If you like turtles, get this book. If you have no other reptile book in your book collection, get this one. Amanda Ebenhack is a rehabber in Florida. She is amazing. So this has a lot of good information about turtles in general and also about how to care for sick ones. Yes. Kids book, this is an excellent kids book by the Salzburgs. When I say learn multiple sources, learn the natural history, attend conferences, 
go go to conservation conferences, go to breeder conferences. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is a, another excellent book if you have fox turtles. Learn the natural history. So thank you. That's great. Carl, yeah, Carl James Franklin is a is a herpologist in Texas. Okay. Amazing. Sorry. Uh, there are four. Four. So, I have a different approach to turtles. I'm not disagreeing with anything you say. You, you keep them more wild than most people. I believe in knowing your animal. Everything about it. It's history. Why it's designed the way it is. You know, what it eats. Most turtles are browsers anyway, and, and uh, opportunistic. So it's really hard to feed them that way in, in captivity. So variety, variety, variety. You know, feed them as much as you can. And uh, uh, this little guy is. Um, does anybody know what it is? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Box Turtle. No. Close. No. A close though. So uh, box turtles are kind of brownish when they're small, and then you have a uh, you know, raised ridge all the way down. But when these are born, they look just like the adults. This is a Florida box turtle. And they look you know, almost like a star tortoise. It's kind of crazy. Um, so this little guy um, was smaller than a quarter. It was really tiny. But it's doing really well, and the, I'm, I'm getting pretty good uh, shell growth. And I believe in keeping it outdoors. So that's that's another issue. It's hard to do, but once you have the right setup, they kind of take care of themselves. And you make a big enough enclosure where they walk. If you look for the feet, or you want the feet to be straight down, and, and, and the shell comes up level, you don't want it tilted back or side. You want it to walk like this. And in the <laughs> Bite my fingers, <laughs> and in the um, he's like, put me down. Um, so if you put it on a smooth surface, the the legs actually splay out to the sides, and they're swimming all the time like this, and which is not natural. And um, I'm going to put him down. So anyway, so, so he, he thinks he's a wild turtle, he's right? And him. I mean, I I'm not saying everybody has to keep it that way, but. Nature does nature best. There's no substitute for the sun. You can have all the bulbs and all the lighting, but the sun is more than just infrared and UVA and UVB. The sun has psychological effects and it moves. So the sun comes up, you know where it's coming. The turtles will position their shell and turn it before the sun even gets there because they know it's going to be there. Then they get heated up in the morning, and they go about their business. If it gets too hot during the day, they go under. Um, and it's and you never have to clean a cage, ever. <laughs> so if you keep them outdoors, there's no cleaning, which is kind of nice. So it's a biological thing. Everything just kind of um, takes care of itself. But again, a turtle this size, without a screen top, you're going to lose it. Uh, raccoons, like you said. Birds, Birds, crows, a hawk would eat this. A, a snake would eat an absent. Sure. Oh, what was that one? Oh, uh, like a year and a half. So yeah, so they're they're doing great. Um, this is one of the uh, protected turtles in Maryland, and um, so you know what this one is. You know? Yeah. You know that? Oh, spotted turtle? Yes, very good. See, you know you're, you're, you're turtles. So spotted turtles, uh, they should be really active. See how active this guy is? So it's used to living outside. It's not used to being held. <laughs> they put me down. Um, but they're, they almost, they become, see, I look at them, they're almost like a, um, Reptilian dogs, they just come running to you because you're the food god. You're the dude with all the goodies to eat, and they just come running to you wherever they are. They could be way far away, and they just come running to you, uh, especially tortoises are that way. 
Anyway, uh, these don't get that big. People think that they're always in the mud or, or in bogs. You can actually find spotted turtles in rivers. I've found spotted turtles in the Gunpowder River 10 foot deep, where I dove in and I, you know, went to the bottom, and there it was. And I, I couldn't believe it. So they, they, they'll go in a big river. But when they're small, you have to have the water shallow. Because I won't do this too long, but, but if it flips over and the water's that deep and it can't flip itself over, it's going to drown. Um, you know, it's which is sad. Uh, all the aquatic turtles in Maryland shut off their lungs in the wintertime, like a light switch. Don't use them. They breathe through their cloaca and the back of their throat. Uh, it's called bugopharynx. And in the lining, in their butt, in the back of the throat, in the mucus, there's these minute capillaries. They can actually take oxygen out of the water, which is amazing to me. And it's kind of a miracle, actually. And they don't need a whole lot of oxygen during the winter. They're not eating because they can't digest because of the temperature. But they're active. Uh, I've seen turtles swimming under the ice. Have you, anyone seen that? Yeah, Martin has. No one? So you can see, you know, the first time I saw it, I was at Lock Raven Reservoir, and I was standing on the ice, and I was moving the snow away. I looked down, and these turtles are just walking along. They're slow, but they're just walking along. Oh, they're not coming up for air. <laughs> How are they doing that? So they're, they're able to take oxygen out of the water. Um, and then as it warms up, then you start using your lungs again. So, you know, all the water turtles do that, even, even alligator snappers. I've had alligator snappers, which are not native to Maryland, under ice, and they've survived just fine. Anyway, here's a little close up. I'm seeing spotted turtles and water turtles still water water. Yes. Well, it's deep. It's deep, right. Um, and I've also seen spotted turtles in, uh, in St. Michael's area in water like that shallow, ditches on the side of the road. When I was a teenager, there were literally hundreds of them in St. Michael's. I don't know um, if they're still there or not. But they, these are just a ditch. And you would walk along, there's one, there's one. I mean, it was so many. Um, so they, they probably could take a little bit of salt as well, but they, they prefer fresh water. And you can forget baby turtles, well, any turtle, but especially baby turtles, when you have a real heavy rainstorm, turtles get washed in some crazy areas. So, you know, they've been, Turtles found in the inner harbor, box turtles that probably got washed down from the dead. Yeah. But me, me and my nephew and Christopher going into the right aid, into yep. the vestibule, and there's a, a little red haired slider. Yeah. Heading into the store. So I was lucky enough to get all the um, water turtles off of fisheries. That's a whole, yeah. that's a long subject. <laughs> they were on the fisheries department and I got them back on where they belong, on the uh, natural resources, wildlife, DNR. And, um, but I couldn't get the snapper back on because the people still eat them. The good news is the snapper is probably the uh, most successful turtle in Maryland, I would say. They're pretty much everywhere and they can live in a variety of places. Plus they get so large, Nothing seems to bother them. Um, and snappers are not these mean turtles people think they are. Out of the water, yes, you go to grab them, they're jumping off, they're snapping. In the water, I've never had a problem with them. I've even actually grabbed their head before, feeling, looking for uh, bob turtles, and I've grabbed the heads of snappers, and they've never, I've never been hit. Not to say that yeah. well, it won't, but. but also, snapper is the only turtle that eats skunk cabbage. And skunk cabbage is that nasty, stinky, 
big leaf plant. Uh, I think it's high in oxalic acid, mm -hmm. and it. Um, I don't think anything it ate it. So if you're in a boggy area and you see a bunch of uh, grass or any kind of foliage bent down and it's like that wide, well, that's got to be a snapper. You know, when you see a nice little path, so you follow the path, you follow the path, and then I stood back and I'm watching this snapper reaching up, just eating skunk cabbage. And I thought to myself, why is it doing that? Because it's got to be stinky, and it's, it can't taste that great. But then I realized, then I learned that mountain tortoise of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, it's called Minoria emmys, um, they will seek out toxic plants to mammals and birds and eat them. The roots, the stems, the plants, they eat everything. And I thought, why would they do that? The only thing I can come up with, this is a guess, this is not, you know, don't take my word for it. My guess is that's how they get rid of internal parasites. Because the, the juice of those nasty plants are so nasty, it flushes them out. And I think it, it helps them. Because they, they every wild reptile is, has a sea of bad things in them and good things, but it's the load that matters. It's it's the balance. So as soon as stress comes into to, to play, you grab an animal out of the wild, you put them in a little tank at home, it's stressful, and then the the, the, uh, the balance gets way out of whack and then they get sick. So uh, that's why I, I always say if you really, really want an animal to get captive born only, Mm -hmm. uh, and let the wild ones do what they're what they're supposed to do, because without uh, wildlife, you know, acting naturally, we suffer. It doesn't matter if it's an insect or a reptile or bird. We actually need wildlife. Um, we get more from wildlife than man-made products worldwide. We get more from nature monetarily. <laughs> than uh, man-made products. And there's been lots of articles written about it. So it makes sense to uh, give nature a fair shake. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Those are awesome. So questions, I mean, who has? Yeah, your question. Um, as far as parasites go, yeah. um, are there any that, you know, tortoises and Turtles are just going to have because they're messier creatures than yeah. the average reptile. Yeah, I mean, you, indoors you have to really keep things clean. Outdoors, I don't worry about it. Now, I do occasionally, I have a microscope and I can, and I have a big chart of all the reptile uh, parasites, color charts, which is nice. It's a pretty big chart. And so when you see something, Generally, you have to use 400 power. So I don't know if you've ever used a microscope. But well, I just took yeah, a, did sure. like a people exam on my energy tortoise as a picture. Okay. Oh, so cool. I don't know if you're like oh, nice. casting screaming all, so we'll talk about it later. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Whatever. But yeah, I'm following, I'm picking up what you're doing now. Yeah, so, so what you do is the safest thing I know is fenbendazole, which they use for horses. Panicure. Panicure. Yes. And um, I think you can overdose by it. Couple thousand milligrams or something. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty safe. safe. But always weigh the animal, and and then it's um, I think it's twenty five mix per mil or up to fifty mix per mil. So you so you have to uh, you have to know the doses. And I, right. I actually made a chart when I was at Hopkins to so so I could just look at the weight and look right. at the dosage. And look at my chart that I made. It took me a long time. There's, there's a website now with a little capital oh, where you can pick the drug. Yeah. Oh, okay. It'll tell you the range, like on the high range, it's okay, the milliliters, on the low range, it's this. Yeah, I suck at math, so it took me a long time to figure it's, it out. It's tricky, well, especially the milliliter and the gram conversion, because sometimes they put it in milligrams per. Yeah, one is, one, is, one is weight, one is liquid. Yeah. 
Right. So sometimes it's easy. That's an easy one to overlook. Yeah. You're trying to figure out what you're right. Right. The the all the, the best thing to get is tractor supply cells don't keep one on. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a, it's a, a liquid suspension. Okay. Like 100, 125 mLs. mLs. So yeah. If it's a liquid suspension. Yeah. I was I was doing the paste. Um, See, I don't I don't like the paste because it's too easy to. Well, I, I've never had an issue with it, but, but again, I only do it, I think of it so as, a, as a balance, like I don't, I don't do it prophylactically, right. like if some, like if I see a behavior change, that's, that's just something a lot of people don't look at their animals carefully, if I see a something in the eye at the bottom, or the body weight's change, or they're not eating correctly, or, or something about it has changed, then you then you investigate it further, and then you fix it right away. If you let it go, let it go, let it go. It's hard to tell when a reptile's sick just looking at it. Yeah, but if you look at the behavior, you can get to it really quickly. And and I'm not a, a big proponent for drugs, so I try to let nature do it. But there is a point where you, it needs a little boost, like like we take an antibiotic or something, and then boom, you, you feel better, right? So the same thing. So I will use it occasionally. I don't use it that much. And I've had yeah. I've had uh, turtles for fifty eight years. You know, I've had turtles since I was seven years old. So uh, I can't do the math. Sixty three years. Sixty three years because I'm seven. So yeah. So uh, but I but always learn from. People doing it, not people talking. Like if someone's bred something many generations, that's a good person to talk to. They'll tell you the pitfalls. They'll tell you the things that went wrong. And uh, now, now that not everybody has to be a breeder. You can just keep it as a pet. But again, uh, I'm kind of against collecting things in the wild. I know the DNR. There was no reptile laws until 1993. Uh, that's when I did my first big show with reptiles, and so they they made they made the laws quickly. And Maryland, believe it or not, is one of the better states for reptiles. We can keep a lot of stuff. We just can't keep a lot of everything. You can't keep a lot of wild caught stuff. And you can't keep a lot of wild yeah. stuff. You can keep you know one of this or up to four of this or it depends on the bowl. It's, it's, it's actually good. reasonable compared to some other states. And they allowed captive breeding. Right. Yeah. With, yeah. with, with right no, paperwork. No, no, no. Well, but compared to a lot of other states. No, Maryland's, uh, and, and, you know, people, uh, or many, many friends of mine, we, we, we hated the DNR. But the, the thing is, once we realized what they were up against and what they're trying to do when we work together, they, Fix the laws. It's better now. When they first started, there was a lot of mistakes made. A lot of mistakes, and it happens. But it's gotten better to where I can keep small animals now. I could I couldn't have them in my possession years ago. So through a lot of negotiating and getting some laws passed, so now we can take captive-born animals. I can't sell spotted turtles or wood turtles, or, but I can give and them away. You you could as long as they're not for it. As long as you have your permit and you have proof how you got them, and you keep your records. As long as they're at least four inches, four you inches, can sell yeah. them in Maryland, but you can sell them under four inches in other states. Right. It's, so. Anyway, it, it's um when I was first doing it. I had to put all my babies in the freezer by law. Well, who's going to do that? It's crazy. So anyway, we fixed that problem. And and so that's why I work closely with the DNR now. And I, yes, we've had our rough spots. And I freely admit it. And, and uh, I wish I could have changed some things. but. But we're at a good place now, and we're we're really trying to do things right by Maryland Wildlife. 
and especially Bob Turtle. A lot of people don't even know what a Bob Turtle is. It's in four tops of four counties in Maryland. And it's one of the rarest turtles in the world. Oh yeah, they always seem kind of like the little like when you ever find one of those. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found a lot of them, and um, uh, once you learn their behavior and learn how they like to live uh, and where they where they uh, roommate, they don't really hibernate. It's called rumination, and they'll follow the roots of trees or or a big bush or or no, or there's rivulets. So in a bog, think of it like Swiss cheese with a bunch of streams underneath and all kinds of waterways. They have memorized that. They have a terrific memory on it. When they go down, they know which way to turn, where to go. They just they just know their area. And if they're happy, they've got food, nobody's bothering them. They can live fine. They stay. I marked uh, two turtles that were mating in a bog. Came back 15 years later. Found the same two turtles that I marked in the same bog in the same place. So if they're happy, they stay. Extra males, of course, move on. And and actually, a lot of um, is this too much information? And actually, the males. Uh, go out of the bog. A lot of males go out of the bog, and they'll go into a stream, into a stream bank, and they'll hang out in the roots and hang on the side of the streams. They're not always in the bog, and depending on where the insects are, they'll, they'll shift. If the insects are on top of the hill during the late summer. That's where they go, especially in the morning when they're slow, when the insects are slow, and they love uh, slugs and. You know, if you see a bunch of turtles with green orange goo on their on their beaks, slug mugs. That's the inside <laughs> slug mugs. That's the inside of a slug. My first time I saw that, oh, they have a disease. <laughs> it's it's slug juice. Uh, and box turtles in Maryland love that. I mean, early spring, you'll see, if you see a lot of box turtles like like I do, you'll see a lot of them with this orange goo. It's kind of comical, actually. And actually, and I found that one location, and I'm not going to tell anyone where it is, uh, where all the box turtles were blue. Their skin was blue. Their face was blue. They were blue, like. But not the shells. Not the shell. Sorry. But when I'm looking at them, and I, I couldn't believe the colors I was seeing. This is in Maryland. This is in Maryland, and I found. Uh, like a dozen of them like that. They're blue. They just, you know, there's blue crayfish. They sell yeah. a pet store. It was that kind mm -hmm. of blue. Was it is what they were eating? I don't know. I it's don't like, know. It's, it's only older males. What's that? It's only older males, isn't it? No. Really? I found, uh, no, I found a, no, I found some females you know, that were blue. Females? They were blue. Can yeah. you tell how old they are when they catch them? Well, like can tell they're like 100 years old. Yeah, no, no. Well, how I tell really old turtles is there's no lines. They're smooth like a baby's bum. So when you have a turtle and you, and you have distinct lines in the scoots, and that's a, a younger turtle. Oh. Now, you, now, some people say you count the rings. But that's not exactly accurate. It's all like buffed out over. Yeah, decades. right, right. It's buffed out for older turtles. But the rings. They could have multiple rings if they had a really good feeding that year. So I don't go by the rings so much. I go by the size of the turtle and what the shell looks like. Like when you see a really old box turtle, like a super old, maybe a hundred. Do you, do you see a lot of them? No, I don't see a lot of them. I used to, but not anymore. I've seen turtles where it's, it's almost like bones. Where they're so old, the keratin just worn down. Uh, and and I mean, think of a box turtle like a person. Some people, some people die at 60, 70, 80. Same with fox turtles. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. They have the extra card cards crossing the road dimension. So, right. So and they're so they could be like fifty, and then they build a, a house somewhere, and then you move around it and buy a car, and then it's the end of the show for that one. 
Right, and and it's all they're compartmentalized. They they used to wander, you know, a fair distance in any direction, but now they're it's like a um, patchwork of they can only go so far. Yeah, they need an environment like every year that's exactly the same. Yeah, what the weather does. Like how many like, turtles cross I turned a lot or or six hundred miles? None. <laughs> they're not gonna cross it and live. So they're kind of stuck where they are. That's why the fragment. state parks and all those are so important. Fragment. They're fragment. Yeah, they're fragmented. They're like you know, artificial localities yeah. or something. Well they yeah, and, and it's not good time. to take a fox turtle from the eastern shore and put it out in western Maryland. That fox turtle will search and search and search. Or its homeland, and they'll never find it ever. Plus, you may have spent 20, 30, 50, 60 years knowing the best place to lay or she, the best place to lay eggs, right. the best place to hibernate, the best place to eat in the spring, the best place to eat right. in the fall where you're trying to put on weight for a formation. Yep. And now it has to learn all that all over again in a new place. I've seen box turtles sit underneath a mulberry tree. And, and just waiting, <laughs> because when the wall mulberries get bright, where they where they go? They drop to the ground, and they'll sit there and pig out on them for I don't know how you know just until they're they're full. But they just they know spots. They know uh, where the berries are, where the where the insects go. You know they can grab grasshoppers early in the morning. When their grasshoppers are heated up, no, yeah, they're not going to grab one unless you know they get really lucky. Slugs early morning. That's when they they're, they they're getting it. slugs don't move that fast. Now, so what does a box turtle eat? Everything. A box turtle can eat poison ivy. Box turtle can eat almost anything. If a baby bird did fall out of a nest, that box turtle will run right over there and just tear it up. Baby mice. Baby mice. So I feed, uh, I believe in whole animals. So I feed a lot of mice and rats, all different sizes, you know, according to their head and everything, to all my, all my uh, turtles, even even redwood tortoises. Because I've, I've seen many photographs of redwood tortoises on the sides of the road eating uh, carrion. I saw a red, I saw this one photo of a dead cow, and. It must have been 20 or 30 red foot tortoises lined up eating this Whoa. dead cow. Yeah. Oh, I, I said, Ooh. So that tells me they eat whatever they can, whatever comes along. Now, do they eat it all the time? No. Yeah, because they don't get it all the time. They don't get it all the time. So they eat a lot of greens, a lot of berries, insects. And the wood turtle of Maryland eats a lot of aquatic animals. That's why wood turtles are not really successful throughout the state. If it's a muddy mess, it chokes out the aquatic insects and the turtles are not going to be there. But if it's a nice clear stream, aquatic plants. Aquatic plants, exactly. So it, so having buffer areas around streams really matters. Oh, this recent storm, you know, I just got my power back. <laughs> I have no power, no water. I just got a text that our power is back. I mean, Sweet. now I've noticed <laughs> when a tree is kind of by itself, that storm came through and just boom, and just you're yeah. down, you know, <clears throat> knocked it right over. But a tree in the forest, like I have a big forest around me, and especially in my backyard, the trees are kind of unaffected. Kind of, okay. Well, it's the same too. thing. Like Hamilton, Lauraville, where we live, there's a lot of trees, and there were very few trees down. Right. So, so, so intact system. systems really matter. I, I mean, it just makes sense, right? It just makes sense. Right? And, and if there's a dead one in there, it like kind of leans yeah. over and gets caught, that's you know, on another tree. That's that's fine, right? You know, dead trees are actually good for woodpeckers and insects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's hard to uh, think of. The whole picture and, and a really good movie to watch is the biggest little farm have you ever seen that the biggest little farm look that up the biggest little farm it explains biodiversity so well this rich couple quit their corporate jobs and they wanted to become farmers they bought this 
granted piece of dried up land. And they figured out how to turn it into a lush, beautiful place producing fruits and vegetables. And they're so successful that they would sell out within an hour. They would go to these markets, they would sell it because they use no chemicals, no herbicides, other. And they figured out when they had a problem with nature, how to fix it. And they fixed problems with more nature. I know it sounds like I'm making this up. If you watch the movie, you'll be like, wow, they're really on to something. So they're, they have internships, and you can actually go there, and they teach you all this stuff. It's a great movie. It's part documentary, part movie. But it explains a lot of things uh, about wildlife. And they touch on snakes and other things, but it, 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 they just look at everything as a whole. And they realize that throwing chemicals at something doesn't work. Because when something gets resistant, what do you do? Well, you make another chemical and it's like that. And it's like this never ending battle. I think I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> I'm going off topic. Sorry. <laughs> Going back to our Zoom audience, I don't think it was because of that. Go <laughs> back to what you said about um, turtles like eating dead birds and carry them. Yeah, I remember I talked I talked to you a few times about. Oh yeah, I remember turtles. I actually brought. I started feeding my box turtle like pinky and fuzzy mice. Now they're his favorite. If I go to feed the snakes, I swear he smells them and pops out. <laughs> and um, but I actually brought. And I brought another one of my turtles. And, and is it doing well? Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd like for you to, to help confirm that for me, but I believe so. Well, he's eating well. You know, what turtle goes up to a pharmacy store and says, give me some calcium? Or what turtle goes to, you know, the store? I want like one cricket and, yeah, and I, I want it, some like man made stuff. I've been doing they variety, like calcium, yeah, like he's breathing that an insect doesn't. Yeah. Right. Now I'm thinking yeah. about it. I just so, think about so you can, fatty, you, though. Uh, Missouri is a good product. I like Missouri's products. So you can feed some of that. But I believe in whole animals. What does that animal eat in the wild? If you can get close to that, you'll never get exactly. If you get close to it, you're going to have a healthy animal. So recently, I've been doing, I found some um, like sardines in just water with nothing else, but they still have the skin and bone. So I've been feeding them some of my turtles. That's fine. That's and fine. They've, okay. And they've been a hit. And then I do the pinkies. And then, like, I also brought with me a Florida snapper. And he doesn't want any vegetation. I've tried. Maybe he'll grow into it. But um, yeah. Um, he likes pinkies too, though. Yeah. I do a lot of insects for both of them. Try um, uh, mulberry, mulberry leaves for snappers. Okay. They love them. I, you know, like put a whole branch in there. But okay. Leaves are, you know, I had like a 50 year old mulberry tree in my backyard, and I think once I finally got it cut down because it was just being messy and everything. You know, because it just yeah, like, yeah. shower a million berries. Yep. Down. I learned like a month later that it's like the best. Or leaf or like so many yeah, it, it has the right. Stuff. Well, it's good roughage, and roughage is important because if, if you feed um, all man-made pellets all the time, it's 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 not the kind of roughage they get in the wild. So they're eating stuff that, like a like a, um, a Russian tortoise eats nasty, dried up dead grass. Like no, actually nasty dried up forest. They're not, they're not much of grass eaters. Well, I mean, they will eat grass, but forbs is anything that's not grass or a tree, okay. basically. I mean, they eat, they, and they get nutrition out of it. I don't know how. <laughs> but the yeah, roughage, the means. roughage is really good. Yeah, I don't really do pellets much at all. I was actually, um, it was I. I had to stop at like a big pet store recently just because I needed mealworms and I couldn't wait to get some online or for like the next expo to get a bunch. Like I I was feeding too much from my roach colony to where it uh, went down in numbers because um, my main thing is tarantulas and I have a lot of mouse to feed with the nymphs, the yeah. roaches. But um, so I went in to grab some mealworms. I was looking at the Missouri diet and it did seem better, but even that one, like, I felt like there was a lot of filler. Like, there's still, like, I forget if there was soy and corn and meat and stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, but, you can feed some of it. Just just don't have that as a main source. I think well, Omega-1 is probably the best. Oh, in moderation. 
But I found, um, I thought one of the benefits of that would be like the, the calcium and the vitamins that are like fortified into it. But I found some frozen, uh, like cichlid, um, feed that was made from like turkey necks and brine shrimp and still had all of the nutrients, but it didn't have the, um, like any other fillers or anything. Yeah, so I, I, for that, I feed a lot of fish too, and I, but I catch them myself. I, I catch. Oh, okay. Yeah, so have you heard of spot fish? It's in the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh-huh. You can catch fifty of them per day, and they like a the great big ones like that big, but most of them are about that big, and they have no thiaminase. They don't have that enzyme that screws up their metabolism and everything. Now in the wild, they can eat thiaminase animals because they don't eat a lot of it. They eat just a little this, a little that. But if you're feeding a lot of thiaminase fish, it could cause problems. So I there's a list that there's several okay. lists on the internet of non you know non-thiaminase and thiaminase. I think um bluegill, yellow perch, spot spot fish. The bluegill are safe exactly I think it is. Like, is that the stuff at the reservoir? They're everywhere. Okay, yeah. Only one fish in the room yeah. where it's spiky and that's big. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and now, There's yellow birds too. now some, no, no. some fish have worms in the meat. When you fillet it, you'll see this white worm. Yeah. I just freeze all my fish. I just freeze okay, it. Yeah, I have a deep freeze. And then you, you deep freeze them for a while and then you thaw them out a couple hours later. I throw in the whole fish. I don't like chop it up. I throw in the whole fish. Now I've got you obviously a lot of that. I, I do rod and reel, but I'm I've been doing it for a long time, so yeah. I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, at I go it. I go I go fishing at times, but I've never really gone for spot fish. You call them? Yeah, spots. Yeah, they call them spots, and they're it's actually a pretty fish. Um, and for some reason, people like to catch them, and then they live line it for for um, bass, for stri- stripers, rockfish. So they put a live spot for rockfish, but I, when I catch rockfish, I use lures, and lures work fine. I don't even use live bait for rockfish, and you're only allowed one a day now anyway, so it's down to one a day. But anyway, so you you go by the rules, and I mean, fifty a day is pretty good. Yeah, and I, I usually catch a lot of turtles. I usually catch you know forty or fifty at a time. But what do you use here? Like a I use I use just worms. Oh wow! Yeah. On on, you, on a, a fake lure. How do you not catch bluegill and like perch and stuff? Then? Well, I I um. You have a spot. I buy um I buy worms in bulk because I go through a lot of worms. I mean, like if you're catching with the rod and reel, um, how do you target spot and or spots? Well, spots are saltwater. And uh, and okay. uh, bluegills are fresh and gotcha. yellow perch are fresh. I actually work on the day for the DNR. Oh, okay. But I'm just I'm doing maintenance at uh, Hammerman Beach. Yeah. But I I find turtles almost every day. Yeah. There's a while where I was finding bags. I haven't seen diamond bags. I've seen a lot of mud turtles painted. Um, a lot of snappers, like in the beginning, middle of June. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't. I don't think I've seen red bellies, so but I've seen uh, red eared sliders, and which I know are invasive, but I've seen them. Oh um, yeah, they're they're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yellow belly sliders. Um, they're not native to Maryland. Yeah, but uh, uh, yellow bellies aren't. Well, so if they're you saying that they got released or they got moved up somehow? Oh gotcha. They're I like the Carolinas. Is. But yeah, I, I definitely well I definitely had it right here, but um, mostly snappers, box, and mud turtles are what I see the most of. So they have a double hinge. The mud turtles? Yeah. Yeah, because the musk only have one hinge. Right. So if you look at it, they have a back flap and a front flap. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, first time I saw one, it was really odd. I was, that's double hinged. Uh, they're they're a unique turtle. I, I, yeah. And they're under a lot of people underestimate them because they're small, but they're really interesting animals. Yeah, I've only I found two or three of them. And they have the biggest, the longest reach with that net. Yeah. Of any turtle. 
Yeah, they can really, yeah. They will try to hold one that's really not happy. So there's a little tiny body and that neck can go almost all the way around. So, uh, a lot of people don't realize the, of the side strike. So snakes do it and a lot of snappers do it. So you think you're just going to go like this. Well, they can go. Yeah. To the side, yeah, you got to be uh, careful. They come up with yeah, the shells too, oh, right? Mm -hmm. snapper. Right, but but people put their finger and they go, <laughs> they do the side strike, you know, really quick. So you have to. <laughs> and stink pot. I saw. I watched a stink pot actually reach. So he was shedding skin and he wasn't happy about it. I actually saw him reach around and grab a piece of skin. On the underside of his carapace, right here. Huh. I couldn't get it on video, but I did get a video of him like reaching all the way around to his toes to pull skin off of his <clears throat> right. nails. Huh. I had a little mud turtle, a you know, five foot diameter white tank, and I had a log in there, and I pulled it out to clean it. And one day I pulled it out, and I'm hearing this click, 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 click. And where I would grab it, it was just a little extension that came off of it. was a bat. Right there. And it would be there every day. And Mud Turtle climbed up there and got the bat and ate the damn thing. And the wings were floating in the water. <gasps> See, tur crazy. turtles are turtles are jerks. unbelievable. <laughs> oh, yeah. And a lot of turtles species bat. have outlived the dinosaurs. A lot of that too. Did they evolve? Uh, I thought the bat was cool. During, during that time? Oh, wow. Like 200 million years Yeah, 200, yeah. Uh, actually, if I have a turtle in my house. It's uh, traced back to 220. Is that a mountain turtle? Yeah. It's the first one that made it over land. Cool. It's the first, it, it, it was the first land toward turtle in the world. They look very well suited for land down though. Wow, that looks fantastic. Are you kidding me? Thank you. I try, I'm trying. Look yeah. at the look at the shell. Bro. I keep a lot of animals. I've had that since January of 2022, so like it's a little over a year and, and a half. And Bright eyes, like like messed up when you got it. Look yeah. at the eyes. A lot of people don't look at the eyes. The eyes are yeah, nice and bright, and, and there's no swelling. And it's so dry, right? I mean, I got it. Then like, the tail is turned up. No, oh, is it? Oh, I see that. So if they were kept too dry, a lot of times that tail will start to turn off. Yeah, but think of them as um, definitely semi-aquatic. So in the wild, the three toed. The three toed. Okay. Yeah. So in, in, in the wild, they're not going to be out in a desert-like setting. They're going to be in moist hides. Yeah. Where, where they're, they're, I use like an ABG mix, and it has a water dish that you can get into and out of. But I would make the substrate moist too. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. You can have I one little you know, dry spot, but I would have most of Yeah, the, I keep it wet all the time. I would keep it wet, yeah. And I've been seeding with isopods, and I'm pretty sure he eats those too. And they're so surprising. Remember, I, I spoke to you on the phone about them shortly after I got it. Like, I hope I helped him. No, you did. Because okay. he had some spots here and here. Yeah. I ended up taking him to uh, Keith Gold. Yeah. And it was superficial keratitis, whatever. But I emailed Matt about it too. But what everyone had told me, like when I got to the vet, he was pretty much like, "You're already doing the right thing." Yeah, yeah. What I was just um, what I what I was at first doing was uh putting a little bit of baked dine on and then rinsing it and safe. putting a curate silver on. That's safe. And uh, but then I just got some chlorhexidine wipes and um, yeah, but he. He's been doing try, great. Try to give unfiltered natural sunlight. They will turn into a different creature all the way. And I know it's not easy to do because you've got, you know, you've got to prepare for Yeah. Who thought there's some like magical Indiana Jones like series of mirrors? Like the indigenous skylight <laughs> announced that like, I can get natural sunlight in my basement now. Uh, uh, snakes are, but no, it's not fun. No, so you want you want the wind? And that's hard to create indoors yeah. properly. You want the rain. You want the, the temp, you want the nighttime temperature to go down, daytime to come up. You want it like the like nature. And it's so hard to recreate that. Why not just put it out there where where they belong? This is the other one abroad. 
about throwing a snap, right? Yeah. Every snapper I see, they always look like they're just going to blow out. Ooh, it needs some calcium. See, this is called curving, curving up. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what you're feeding it. Uh, I do pinkies for them too. I, I would do, I would do uh, I would do a small mouse for this guy. Okay. Uh, what you can do is it has more has more bone, more calcium. In D3. Uh, okay. I'll so what I would do um so when you you know you know, humanely kill the mouse or rat. I buy them for as a dog. Okay. And then you you uh, you just take your finger and you on the back and just split the skin, or you can use scissors. One little cut, and you pull evenly both directions. And it's it's like unzipping it. The skin, from, the fur comes right off. Okay. And that gives them a good purchase to get going. Man, you're going to be skinning your fur forever. Well, no, I, no, so, no, I gave him a bigger mouse recently, and he only ate the head, and I was a little surprised. No, do... Um, Take some of the skin off. You don't have to take every bit of skin off, but take a lot of it off. Yeah. I guarantee you it'll be even. Okay. Because it'll be like, hmm, that's tasty. I'm also, sometimes they have a little hard time, right here, especially with rat skin, is a lot tougher. Okay, yeah, I have small rats as well. This is the nitty gritty that a lot of people don't want to do, but. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons I brought them. I wanted to have the. Uh... That's one. Or you can make your own too. You, you can make your own. Now, uh, I raised. Uh, Birds of prey when I was younger, and I've raised you know uh, black vultures, five and a half foot wingspan. And what I did is I got one of those old time grinding meat machines, yeah. you know, with the, with the holes in it. One of my friends uses that for tag food. And I would throw in there like whole fish, scales and all, and I throw in there vegetables. I throw, I just throw everything, everything, anything I could find, crickets, yeah, <laughs> grasshopper, and I would just grind it up. <laughs> And it just came out like this gray glue, uh, goo. And I'd make these hamburger patties and I stacked them up in the freezer, right? And I would just pull them out. Is that vulture? Is that you get a little loved? And that's sort of what the directing weights are with a more controlled right. uh, ingredient list. Right, but I, but I, I learned that uh, if, you're, if you eat hot dogs all the time or you eat donuts all the time, what are you going to look like? You're gonna, look, you're, gonna look, you're gonna look like a big blob. Yeah. So so think of your health and think of it. Well, the reptiles are the same way. They have got to have the right minerals and vitamins in. Now and to me, the sun is like the magic thing. But um, if you can't bring it indoors, try putting it outdoors an hour or two in a screen. See, make sure it doesn't get too hot and all that. If you put it in a glass aquarium, it's, that's way too hot. That that thing will heat up yeah. and it'll kill it. And it's also not going to get much real sunlight. Yeah, so you want to have. Yeah. So I use a lot of uh, half inch galvanized mesh. So okay. half half inch galvanized mesh is you know something similar like to chicken wire. Yeah, but it's so a lot smaller. Hardware cloth. Hardware cloth. Yeah. Hard hard yeah. And you take flat black paint. I use. I think that, that that size is rat proof. It's rat rats rat can't chew through. Yeah, mice can't get through it either. Yeah. And raccoons and can't stick their little hands through. And I take a roller, yeah. a paint roller, and just lightly roll it, and it takes away that silver and it kind of disappears. And you can look at the animal; it's, it looks black, it looks nice, and the sun goes right through it. Now, if you use window screen, that actually blocks the sunlight too much. Is that interesting? Yeah. But if you use a half inch or bigger, depending on what you have. It lets the sun through. Okay. Like, Does he ask? Sometimes. I, I do have a helid in and I have an area you can get up. But he doesn't he'll kind of go through phases. You know, yeah. he'll ask a lot for like a couple of weeks. Does he have UDD? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um I mean it's not in terrible shape. It's just um the shell is starting to see mm -hmm. how the shell is starting to do all the weird stuff. Yeah. Our one like pancake boards is starting to look like that. He's like seven or eight though. So, and I, I got him earlier this year. And so mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I don't have those point of reference that happened this whole time. And it's like there's such a weird animal having to know what a good one looks like compared to, you know, other. Well, there, other now, there's a lot of good looking captive horns out there. But 
Pancakes. But I think it's part of their, you know, extra peculiar trait they have, where well, it's staying on the edge because they're flat. Well, what do they do in the water? This is what I always say. What, what do they do in the water? Spend a lot of time going from hiding place to hiding right. place. And, and when come they, out first. When they do eat, they come out and, do, 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 and then they run back. They're the only animal you're talking about tortoises that I'll run to you because you feed them. They don't run. They they, they don't run. never. They will never run to me. Sometimes when I put food out, they can be bothered by my I, presence. I kept them for a while. They ran from me. They will run away from you. Um, yeah. You yeah. Them, you I've only had them for run. like six months so far. So but. Build build in a copy, uh, whatever it's called. You know, a copy. Make a copy. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So yeah. don't. Uh, but you gotta make it sturdy. You don't want to cr crush them with rocks. Because they'll move one and then they'll like, Yeah, so you, you take nice big heavy and you, you position them just right and they will get in there and they'll feel just like snug as a plug in a rug, right? And they their shell is like expanding. Mm -hmm. and it's like flexible. Flexible and crazy. Just, and they just get in there and they just go, oh, and they feel safe. And then nothing's happening. Then they come out, put some food out there. I mean, make yeah. make them like they are in the wild. I think I kind of have that going on. They just I need to give them something like three times bigger than what they have now. Right. I need like three times as many pieces of rock in hides as what they're doing now because they only have like a couple places to go to. Yeah. And not like a third, you know, option. My feeling is you never make a reptile cage too big. <laughs> you can make yeah. it as big as you want. Yeah, I gotta and figure out how to. Except except when they're hatchlings, you want to monitor them and. But once they get going, make it as big as you want. You know, you know the um, like plastic file holder things, or your inbox, outbox, in an office. Oh, they have, you have stackable trays for your paperwork. Mm -hmm. Those plastic ones, you can arrange those, even super glue them together, epoxy them together. They make really good hides for um, pancake Oh, that's good. Yeah, so it's like something you wedge in, but it's not. Yeah. Well, I would yeah. still. Well, I would. Well, this is just my opinion. Don't don't say you have to do it. I I, I steer away from aquaria because of great glass breaks and whatever. Right. Yeah. So I like you know big plastic tubs, uh, you know giant uh, rubber maids or whatever. And you can you can put the big rocks in there and it won't affect it. And I've yeah, never had a rubber maid tub ever leak. And I've had them for decades. Yeah, ago. I got like a baker shelf with some aquariums with that appear to drag. And now what I needed to do is like replace the whole thing with like a pan on the ground that's like you know yeah. three by eight feet or something. Yeah. And then above that is right. you know where the bearded dragon hangs out. To, to give you an example, like um, I, I, have, I have some tortoises like this big or so, and I, I one of my pans is ninety feet long. It's not big enough. They use every inch of them, <laughs> every inch. So you can't make it too big, you know. Uh, and also, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a big believer in sight blocks. So whether yeah, it's whether it's indoor size, or yeah. yeah, because if they, if they can see through and they and they see something green on the other side or they they they, they want to go that way, but if they don't see it, then they then they stay in the enclosure and they learn. And also, and having a high spot in an enclosure is really good because they they learn where they are. They're, they're very visual. Turtles and tortoises are very visual, and they like to know, you know where they are, where their home base is. And I believe that they have an internal um, GPS like birds. Um, I don't know if that's all tortoises. Or you I think they do. Um, I think wood turtles have it. Uh, we know sea turtles have it. For sure, but, I think yeah. but something like something like a pancake tortoise yeah. might be the least type that would really rely on it because they have right. a favorite hole. They have like right. five favorite holes, and they're like, okay, I'm never going anywhere but here. Right, but they until memorize until the food disappears. Even even uh, even snakes in Maryland, like there was this one black rat I was trying to catch, great big giant thing, and I would see it, and it would just disappear. Like, where? Where? Got to come back another day. Just come back and see it. Sneaking up on it, gone. It's like it was like it was like a magic act, gone. So so one day I decided, okay, I'm just gonna sit here and watch this thing. Yeah. It was a tiny little hole that squeezed his body into, like you know, on the side of a rock, 
And that's where it was going. It, it had memorized. So when it was in trouble, it knew. If it went in there. It makes total sense. Like they're not going to do anything until they know they have that spot. Right. I call it the dip out spot. Right. They always got a spot. They just dip out there. They're like, oh, so, oh, he means watching, going away. Right. And then you sit there and come out. Like, uh, I, I don't hurt the whole time, but, you know, like water sneaks a lot. Bring yeah. the reservoir. Yeah. I, you know, I traced one back. And it was like, oh, there's just a tiny crack here. It's, you know, it's got half a second and it's safe. Mm -hmm. But then uh, two seconds later, it can be back out in the sun again sure. and get all the things it wants. But it needs to find that, like, little hiding spot. It's really easy to get to first. Sure. I flipped over sheet tin when there's nothing under it. Closed it. <laughs> didn't, it didn't, didn't mess anything up. Come back 20 minutes later, here's the snake. So they, 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 they they're, move, they're, they're moving around. They made it heard me coming. Who yeah. knows what? Um, so, like, black rats. In Maryland, the black rat snake, which is an underestimated snake, it's a fantastic snake. Everyone knows they have a high vernacular in the winter, but they also have them in the summer. And and I'm, I've talked to a lot of people it's, about is this. Is it communal or it's yes. individual? No. Oh, okay. No, it's, and how I know that is I saw this humongous tree. I mean, it was, it must have been 30 feet high. It was really crazy. This grapevine was growing up, lapping around this tree, going up to the top. Like a monkey, I climbed this grapevine, which is really dangerous, and I got way up at the top of this tree because I saw a black rat, you know, way up on a branch. I said, oh, let's, let's see if I can you know, get a better look. I get up there, and it's gone. It didn't drop down. It didn't fly by me. It didn't grow wings. So I get up there and I see this hole in the tree. It was a pretty good sized hole. So I broke off a stick and poked it in there a little bit. And I felt the snake, I felt it move. And then poked it a couple of times, the snake got So you took a hand in there, right? Well, I was going to, but then the snake came out. And, I, and then, so it came out. So I'm, I'm like very carefully, I mean, how you touch things really matters. If you grab it, yeah, it's going to bite you, resist. But if you're so easy and so slow, so I'm pulling the snake out. I'm a resistance, I wait, pull it in. So I set it on a branch. And I'm looking back in the hole, and I stuck my stick in there. And there's another one. And there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> I pulled five snakes out of this hole so in the middle of the summer. That's that. How hot was it? Hot? It was hot. It's like a nice moist. It was like August. August. Spot to, uh, I don't know what it was, but that that was odd to me. So I thought, okay, maybe they got summertime dams too, where it was like the perfect spot well, for like, black red. A lot of places in North America in the summer is like too hot for reptiles. During during daytime, right? I mean, it was like it was like, like a hotel for snakes. They're not in the desert. They're definitely looking for somewhere cool, like yeah. cooler to be in August. Like I have a bunch of bull snakes, and I saw some video about you know the habits through the year, and it, yeah, it's just like a lot more than you know, than you think. Yeah, you know, because it's like well, yeah, and, you know, spring they're out in the prairies catching stuff because the sun's more mild, but they're not gonna like. Being in a field in August when it's like 100 degrees, they, yeah. like, they all retreat to the woods, you know, yeah, yeah. and they do woods, snakes in the woods stuff. Yeah, I, I used to catch a lot of bull snakes in Montana, and uh, they got really 